everyone. Thanks so much for coming on this cold night. It's great to see all of you here, and I really am so thankful that you came. Uh, tonight I'm talking about uh, a set of teachings, a book called the Bodhicharya Vatara, and that means the guide to the path of awakening. And it's a marvelous, amazing book written by a monk called Shantideva. And he wrote it in the 7th to 8th centuries in a, a university, monastic university of Nalanda in northern India. And this uh, university was on the Silk Road, the Ipekyolu. Uh, and so in front of that university would go the caravans and the trade routes of goods and information from the west all the way to the east. And the university had a great influence all the way from Central Asia to China and even to Indonesia. So Shantideva was part of, of a connection in the world. And he saw this journey. And this journey, he uses the caravans and he uses the journey very much as a metaphor in his work of the path of awakening. Uh, and it's interesting that a few mystics have done this, and they've also been on the Silk Road. Lao Tzu, two centuries before, wrote The Way of the Tao, and he wrote that also on the Silk Road in northern uh, China. And our Mevlana in the 13th century was in Konya, also on this trade route. And they used the journey, uh, travel, uh, both outer and inner travel, as a, a symbol and a metaphor for the spiritual journey. And Sangharachita writes about this book, and he describes it as one of the brightest gems of Mahayana Buddhism, a combination of ecstatic devotion and incomparable insight. And it's kind of, the teachings are Shantideva's own realizations on the path. Uh, of, of his own own path of, of awakening. But it's also a very vibrant, lively book where you feel like he's actually sitting with you in the room or you're sitting at a table with him and he's talking to you because he speaks so informally and uh, sometimes quite shockingly, really. He, he speaks of himself as, um, oh, I, the deluded fool. And then he also criticizes us, the reader, for some of our human faults like uh, hatred and jealousy and um, meanness and competition. And you feel like he's speaking to you and giving you like a little slap uh, and uh, telling you how it is that you're acting and letting you see that. And he also appreciates the reader and congratulates the reader for taking the step on to this journey, this path of awakening. Uh, and he sort of tempts us by talking about the beauty of this path, by describing its beauty. And I'm going to start now by reading some uh, verses from the Bodhicharya Vatara. So first, about this path and journey. This is the supreme medicine curing the sickness of the world a tree of shelter for weary creatures staggering along the road of existence, the causeway to cross over bad rebirths, open to all who travel. It is the rising moon of the mind, mitigating the defilements of the world. It is the brilliant sun dispelling the mist of ignorance from the world. It is the fresh butter risen up from churning the milk of the true dharma. And dharma here means reality. For the caravan of humanity, traveling the road of existence, hungry for the enjoyment of happiness, this is a feast of happiness, offered as refreshment to all beings who approach. So it's a, a famous book, this. And it's also part of uh, a flourishing of Mahayana Buddhism that had happened uh, one or two centuries before the writing of this. And Mahayana Buddhism looked back at 
the early life of the Buddha and how he also traveled the roads of northern India teaching and offering kindness and compassion to all people that he came in contact with. And Mahayana Buddhism combines this, combines this loving compassion and the wise teaching of the Buddha, combined with the intention of going toward enlightenment, not only for oneself, but for all beings. And, and that's the quality of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, Dalai Lama really loves this book, and they say that he always has it uh, by his side. Uh, and one of his favorite um, verses is from the last chapter, and it reads, As long as space abides, so long may I abide, destroying the sufferings of the world. Um, Shantideva also encourages us to, to take on this way of thinking and he does it in a very, as I said, informal uh, way as if he's just talking to you at a table and uh, here's a, a quote and it says Hey mind, make the resolve I am bound to other others from now on you must you must have no other concern than the welfare of all beings. And that's really something that comes through all the time in his writings. It's a concern for all beings and <coughs> beings that aren't necessarily human. He's not talking about human beings. He's talking about every being existent in the world. Uh, and the, the special figures that most kind of embody this altruistic intention of offering to all beings are these poetic, mystical figures of the bodhisattvas <coughs> or uh, the caravan leaders, as, as uh, Shantideva calls them, the unique caravan leaders of the journey. And these uh, beings are said to have reached, they reached the last stage of enlightenment. They could take Buddhahood. They reached this stage. But instead, they chose not to do so and to stay in the, in the world and help all beings to gain enlightenment before they did it themselves. And in a way, it kind of makes sense when you think about being enlightened. If you, It's sort of a strange thing to do just for yourself and just go off and say, I'm, I'm enlightened and I leave this world with all its problems. And so this way of thinking is, is kind of in some ways uh, a logical as well as very beautiful way of thinking. So now the content of the talk. Uh, first I'm going to talk about Shantideva as a, as a person and a figure and the structure of the book and how the teachings uh, help us on, on our own practices on the path. And then I'm going to talk in some detail about uh, a journey that I took uh, last year from spring to autumn and how I tried to put the teachings into um, practice and what kind of came about with that. And then secondly, I'd like to look at the bodhisattvas. I think it'll be two. I don't think there'll be time to talk about three, but I'd like to kind of discuss these, these uh, mythical figures a little bit in detail. And then thirdly and lastly, uh, I'll talk about what uh, the bodhicharya, the Tara, means as part of a world vision that exists really today and is growing today. So let's get started now with the first part on Shantideva. Uh, Shantideva was um, a seemingly humble monk in the university and he was kind of ridiculed and made fun of by uh, other monks because he, he worked all night. It's said, these, this is a legend actually, there, there are no real facts about him, but this story says something about the way Buddhists look at, at wise people and, and the way Buddhists look at teachers. 
Um, so the story goes that he worked all night and he slept all day. And so the other monks thought he's a really lazy guy and kind of an idiot too. And so they used to say that the only practices that Shantideva had perfected were sleeping, eating, and shitting. And those were his talents. And they challenged him uh, to give a talk to the whole university. And he accepted. And they put him on the stage. And he said, what would you like me to speak about? Would you like me to speak about the history of, uh, of Mahayana Buddhism? He had written an encyclopedia about that. Uh, and they, or would you like me to say something from my own, uh, my own work? And they said, oh yes, you, you say something of your own. And so he stood there and they say that the legend says that he recite, recited this whole uh, book of the Bodhicharya, the Vatara, from the very beginning to the end. And then he rose up into the sky and he disappeared, never to come back to the university. And it said that he went to the places of the poor people and the suffering. And he spent his life helping others. And so that kind of image uh, is, is a, a very Buddhist genre of looking at their teachers as, as humble people who do not use their knowledge uh, for their own gains, but for, for the help of other people to help others. And Sangharachita has something to say about that. And he writes that real spiritual teachers do not make claims about themselves, and they do not allow claims to be made on their behalf. They are not out to impress. They are not after power. Anyone who does make such extravagant claims is not a spiritual teacher, but a politician. And that's kind of important, I think, at this time of, of a kind of degenerated politics and showmanship that's visible in the world, to see that there was a time that respected another kind of way of, of being. So now, the structure of the book. Uh, the beginning of the book, as we could sort of see when I read some of those verses, is kind of attempting, uh, showing us how beautiful it is to be on this path of liberation and how wonderful it is to, to dedicate oneself to the liberation of all beings. And then the book moves in to the practical guide of what we have to do to liberate ourselves in order to liberate other beings. We have to look at ourselves and work on ourselves. And uh, the basic structure of the book is around uh, six practices called the six paramitas. And those are the six perfections. Uh, that also means the six going, it go, means going to the other shore or um, going beyond. And so that sort of shows that there's six spiritual uh, practices of transformation or transcendental practices. And they are um, dana, which is generosity, sila, which is ethics, kshanti, which is patient forbearance, virya, which is skillful effort, dhyana, which is meditation, and prana, which is wisdom. These practices can be done by us, and they're also the practices of the bodhisattvas themselves, these uh, six transcendental practices. Uh, tonight, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to speak about two of them. Let me make sure that I've done. Yeah, OK. Before I speak about those two, in Shanti Deva describes these beautiful qualities often in their negative form. He talks about the negative qualities of not having having this. And he does that so that we can see in ourselves what we need to work on. So rather than generosity or lovingness, he would speak about the opposite. And that kind of goes with a a Vedic, uh, ancient way of seeing uh, medicine 
and seeing the healing of, of human beings. Uh, because they, what they did was they looked at the toxins in the body and they tried to cleanse the toxins and uh, then at the same time or after bring in healing medications and therapies. And uh, Shanti Deva's book, as well as a lot of the early Buddhist uh, suttas, talk a lot about defilements and um, ailments and illnesses and impurities because of offering antidotes to that and offering the way to, to be well on the path. And uh, that is, is how he works with the um, six paramitas. So uh, let me see here. I think I've got some qu quotations, some verses to, to read to you about that. <clears throat> I am medicine for the sick. May I be both the doctor and their nurse until the sickness does not recur. This band of robbers, the defilements, seeks out a point of access. When it has found one, it plunders and destroys life in a good realm. And that's very much the way Chinese medicine would look at illness, that it finds an access through unskillful ways of living, an access into the body. And so this is also an access uh, into <coughs> spiritual practice by uh, having unskillful habits and, and ways of thinking. All right. So... Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, an element of awareness that is needed so that we can understand that something is wrong before we can take on something that's right. So, or something is unskillful before we can take on something that, that works well on our path. Um, if you, if, if you're a really angry, bitter, mean uh, person. It's not, you just don't suddenly turn into a kind and loving being until something has been understood about uh, the way uh, one's views have, have created this over your lifetime or many lifetimes. And then one is able to move on to uh, other ways of being. So. Um, just as sickness is not intrinsic to the body, bad habits and mistaken views are not intrinsic to the character, but are defilements to be cleansed. So now I'm going to go into the detail of two of these uh, paramitas. The first one is kshanti, and, and kshanti is forbearance or, or um, patient forbearance. And it's not uh, an attitude of just standing something very difficult in life. It's actually a very positive attitude of taking what life has to offer. And uh, Shantideva suggests that we strengthen ourselves, both mentally and physically, that we have be become able to endure life more strongly. Uh, and he offers a lot of positive support uh, in order to do this to strengthen our bodies and our minds. And I'll, I'll read some more quotations from him. Happiness is scarce. Suffering persists with no effort, but only through suffering is there escape. Therefore, mind be strong. There is nothing which remains difficult if it is practiced. So through practice, with minor discomforts, even major discomfort becomes bear bearable. The irritation of bugs, gnats, and mosquitoes, of hunger and thirst and discomfort, such as an enormous itch, why do you, ha why do you not see them as insignificant? Cold, heat, rain, and wind, journeying and sickness, 
imprisonment and beatings. One should not be too squeamish about them, otherwise the distress is worse. So he's kind of encouraging us to be strong and not to make a lot out of difficulties, to try to, to be um, patient and forbear the difficulties of life. Um, he also looks at the psychological attitude, attitudes of anger, blame, and hatred, uh, and he doesn't accept this victim mentality. Uh, he describes these ways of thinking and acting as the horrific hook cast by the anglers, and anglers are fishermen, so it's the horrific hook cast by, angler, by the fishermen, the defilements. So he's calling the fishermen the actual habits that we have, uh, the unskillful ways of being, and they hook us and catch us into being a certain way. It's not us that are, that are doing this, it's, it's ways of thinking and habitual ways of being that hook us. Uh, he does this quite, quite cleverly, I think. Um, I think we can understand some of this best by some compilations of his verses that came from my Dharma study class, and I'd like to read some of that. Um, when the thorn of ill will is stuck in our heart, our mind can't find peace, we can't enjoy anything, and we sleep badly. If we are twisted by ill will, even those who depend on us will want to bring us down. Even our friends won't want to know us. We can be as generous as we like, but no one will like us. To be blunt, there is just no way that an angry and resentful person can be happy. Happiness is something very important to Shantideva and to Buddhism, that we be well and happy. And he goes into great detail to explain that there isn't really any reason for anger because to be angry and blame one thing doesn't make sense because there's so many conditions that have come together to create an event that to try simply to put it on one thing uh, is just foolish. Uh, and I realized that I'd actually lived that a couple weeks ago without realizing it. I was in Taksim and I was taking the escalator and those escalators are like two, two stories, two floor escalators really long. And I was at the bottom, toward the bottom of the escalator and uh, it was empty. There was a woman on the top and she dropped her big piece of luggage and it fell down the escalator. And I didn't realize, I heard this noise, and I was thinking, what's that noise? And then I turned around, and this huge luggage was coming after me. <laughs> I just pulled away, and it hit my leg. And I actually am still uh, very bruised and wounded from that. And I was just aghast. And I, I, the bag went on, and then I got off, and I was checking my leg, and the woman came down, and she just didn't even look at me or say anything, <coughs> just went for a bag. And I, I got angry, and I said, you're just so bad. This is just so awful. Why didn't you call down to me? Why didn't you warn me? You just don't even, you didn't even care about what happened to me. And she didn't say anything. She just sort of sh pointed at the metal part of the bag that seemed to be fine to me and walked off. And her husband then came, or her partner, man she was with, came and was started to get, get angry with her and talk to her. But they totally ignored me and they stood next to me when I got onto the the metro. And I was angry with her for a couple of weeks, or for maybe a week. And then I started thinking, well actually, I started thinking about her face and how frozen she was and how not present she was and how there must have been actually something seriously wrong with that woman. She just had no reactions. She might have been a drug addict or a victim of abuse. Uh, some, or someone with strong psychological problems. And I was telling her she was bad and getting angry with her, but there was a much wider, wider situation that I wasn't seeing. And when I saw that, I felt very differently about what had happened. So it's kind of a good way, I think, of, of looking at things. 
and I've got a quote on it too, I'm sure. And yeah, I do. We don't get angry at an attack of indigestion or nausea, even though it causes suffering. So why do we get angry at sentient beings? Their unskillfulness is just as much the product of conditions. Nothing arises independently. Everything is dependent on other things, and these other things are dependent on other things again. So why should we get angry at phenomena that are not autonomous, but exist like the things we see in a magical illusion? If someone hits me with a stick, I don't blame the stick, but the person is wielded by ill will, just as the stick is wielded by the person. So um, the stick is held by the person, but the person is also held by something. The person is held by uh, the defilement of ill will or anger or delusion. And so to get angry at the person is like getting angry at the stick. I think it's quite a, a good analogy. So if we see, this is another uh, verse. So if we see a friend or an enemy behaving badly, we should remember that their behavior is caused by conditions and not allow it to disturb our happy state of mind. Another uh, practice that he uh, suggests for forbearance and patience is um, the reversal of yourself and your enemy. To see an enemy not as an enemy, but as a teacher. Uh, he's got something really, he's really wild the way he, he makes these uh, analogies. They're wonderful. So let me just find where that is here. Since it helps me on the path to awakening, I should long for an enemy, like a treasure discovered in the home acquired without effort. It is really independence upon his malign intention that forbearance is produced, and in that case, it is really he that is the cause of my forbearance. I must worship him as the true dharma, or the true reality. So he's saying, you know, thank your enemy because your enemy is going to make you strong and see things that you might not have seen before. And that made me remember the Dalai Lama's autobiography that I read so many years ago. And that was the first time I read something like that. And I looked back to find uh, a quotation from the Dalai Lama that, was say that said this, and I did find it. He says, an enemy teaches you things, such as forbearance, that a friend generally does not. If the Chinese oppressed us, it could only strengthen us. So it's another way of looking at uh, the difficulties of life, always bringing it back to our own dealing with things and never taking a role of a victim. So that's the first uh, well, it's actually the second paramita, but it's the, one, the first one that I'm speaking to you about. And now I'm going to speak to you about another one called virya, which is vigor or skillful effort, effort in pursuit of the good. And Shantideva describes, uh, again, defilements and ailments that keep us from having this uh, energy to do good. And those are laziness, low self-esteem, and discouragement. And it looks a lot like depression. Uh, again, I'm going to read from the text. What is vigor? The endeavor to do what is skillful. What is its antithesis called? Sloth, clinging to what is vile despondency, and self-contempt. Hey, you, expecting results without effort, so sensitive, so long-suffering, you in the clutches of death, acting like an immortal, hey, sufferer, you are destroying yourself. 
Now that you have met with the boat of human life, cross over the mighty river of suffering. Fool, there is no time to sleep. It is hard to catch this boat again. And uh, for the Buddhists, it's really important that we are born as uh, humans, that it's a great merit because to be a human is, is the most the easiest way to reach enlightenment. Uh, all sentient beings, it's possible, but humans have this ability to, to go for enlightenment. And so uh, he suggests to us that we really feel the value of, of the place that we're in. And so to instill right, rightful effort, he suggests that we, um, find out from what we really are. Ah, yeah, okay. To instill rightful effort in us, Shantideva is separating the defilements from what we really are and what we really can be. And his solution is to instill in us positive practices like antidotes to an illness. And those are the practices of meditation and the practices of insight so that we can find our way out of the difficult defile, defilements that hold us down. So I'm just going to read one last thing on that. Here we are. The powers of skillful desire, of self-confidence, of joy, and of letting go all serve the needs of living beings. So meditating on the benefits of following the path, we should summon up enthusiastic desire for what is wholesome. With insight, this becomes easy, and we don't suffer from giving up evil or becoming mentally ill by become, or become mentally ill by becoming wise. In fact, skillful actions give us physical pleasure, and wisdom delights the mind. So it all sounds like an amazing practice to do, but it's uh, not as easy as it sounds. And I decided that I wanted to take up some of this practice last year when we studied this in Dharma study um, last end of, end, of, uh, end of winter, beginning of spring. And I was particularly moved by these two uh, paramitas, uh, forbearance and, and uh, skillful effort, because I have a past of being always in a rush and, and finding things a bit hard to take in life. I was born a very, uh, um, how would I say, rather spoiled and, and with a very easy life. And so the difficulties of life seemed very hard to take a lot of times. So I wanted to practice that. And virya, the uh, rightful effort, or effort in pursuit of the good, um, I had times of uh, low self-confidence and depression and in my life. And I thought, OK, I'm going to take that on. And I loved his hard-hitting words. Uh, they just gave me this feeling of, I'm just going to go on that and do that. And uh, I remember in the Dharma study, we were talking about Virya that night. And I remember, uh, you, Gurchen, you were there very much when we were discussing that. We had a, uh, a visiting um, order member, Loka Bandhu. And I said, I'm going to just kick it out of my life, this low confidence of mine that's just holding me down. And I need to get on on the path. And I'm just kicking it out. And